first of all, I should thank uh, the Mr. Esfandiar for doing such a great dialogue, because more than the business, I think that the dialogue is helping us to cooperation, to, to collaboration. And uh, yes, I, as Book City CEO, uh, we are, just let me just introduce a little bit about my Please, yeah. job now. I am the first founder of the book and cultural products retail industry, Book City chain store, mm -hmm. 80 stores in Tehran and other cities. And also in retail, I have e-books, the first e-book uh, created in Iran, it was uh, by our foundation, Fidibo, Firuzan Digital Book. And also, I got Versace Cavalli Armani franchise license for Iran during the sanction. What I mean during the sanction? I mean that the European com companies uh, was uh, cooperating with Iran even during the sanction, but through another companies in Europe, for example, in Switzerland or in Italy. Among, I, I think that the main answer is based on the quality and on the nature of the goods. Which kind of goods mm. Iranian would prefer the foreign production or local production. Mm -hmm. For example, as I know in the Latin books about the science technology, we prefer the foreign books, the English, the British, the uh, American universities, publishers. In fashion, we prefer the foreign books. In the quality of the uh, products, we prefer uh, in some certain fields, the foreign qualities. Mm. But in, and for example, in detergents, yes, because Iran has the experience to produce. You know that the brands before revolution, which has a good market in the region, was Tide and Bath, it was the Iranian brand. So in detergent, Iran has history. Mm -hmm. In textile, Iran has history. But in some new uh, generation of the goods, yes, we didn't have the history, we didn't have the experience, so we go, we prefer the uh, non-Iranian uh, products. Okay. Uh, if I can uh, yes, add please. something. Yes. Yeah, sure. The most frequently question asked by uh, uh, Iranian consumers when they want to buy uh, international brand products is, uh, mm -hmm. is it a counterfeit or is it a real true brand? Mm -hmm. And uh, they do this because uh, for a long time we had a very large share of Chinese products mm -hmm. uh, imported to Iran, and we had a lot of fake products. So, I mean, does this go for all products, whether it's a Hermes scarf, yes, a Louis absolutely. Vuitton bag, absolutely. or a Rolex watch? Even, even jeans or pants, or yeah. when, when they go to a store uh, with um, international brands, they want just to make sure that the store is real uh, uh, international brand and mm. not uh, uh, counterfeit or, or fake. So uh, especially for the uh, sports equipment, mm -hmm. you see today. And because the international product now are higher, uh, higher price, so it's, it's very expensive. So they want just to make sure that they are paying for the true brand. This is the reason that they're, mm -hmm. they're worried about that. And I think we've seen from those international brands who have been successful at getting into the market that they do phenomenally well. Uh, if you can set yourself I mean, for up example, for example, which brand? For example, Debenhams from yeah. the UK um, has been in Iran for the last eight years. I mean, Debenhams has an actual physical they outlet. They do, and, yeah. and that's a massive advantage yeah. um, because of the fragmented nature of the distribution network within Iran, particularly for fast-moving consumer goods, for yeah. example where there is uh, a relatively small number of high quality, large retail spaces versus what you find in Europe. Yeah. The, the preponderance of the local convenience store uh, is where a large majority of, of Iranians buy their goods. Mm. That makes it very difficult for uh, FMCG brands to establish distribution networks yeah. in Iran. Yeah. Ali. I mean, to, to, to add to uh, my co panelists in terms of what they're saying. I think a lot of um, Iranian retail nowadays is predominantly being shaped by the consumer. And if you want to 
get an overarching view of what the who the consumer is today. I mean, the bulk of our uh, demographics are dominated predominantly by millennials. Mm -hmm. And millennials in Iran are not any different than how they are anywhere else in the world. So 55% of our population is between the age of 15 to 35. The median age is roughly around 28, 29 years old nowadays. And if you look at how millennials are taking shape now, so they're coming into their peak in terms of their spending years, so they're sort of earning their sixth year, seventh year paychecks. They're basically uh, starting to come out of the nest egg, starting to form families. They're quiet. They have less money to spend. They're getting married later because of this. And a lot of how they're shaping behavior is basically being uh, shaped nowadays is predominantly because of the circumstances that they're under. So yes, there is a huge pent up demand for sort of foreign products and foreign goods. The millennials are extremely well connected on mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And so they're very fast forward, fast fashion. And uh, so they're very sort of fashion forward, if you like, when it comes to things like uh, apparel. Um, uh, but nevertheless, a lot of their decision making that is taking place nowadays is predominantly price comes first. And I think uh, if there is value, uh, I think there's less tendency for the consumer in Iran to be more concerned about whether or not sort of quality is ranking right. hi as highly as it used to before. And this, so, uh, this yeah. is a slight lateral leap, but uh, yeah. uh, I mean, Apple famously has just said that it, it can't uh, any longer approve Iranian app developers. But presumably, Iranian app developers will keep developing and will put, will make their apps available on iPhones. Uh, does yeah. that mean that the perception of quality and trustworthiness in an Apple product is going to go down in Iran? Uh, no, no. So, so uh, I think the point that I was trying to make is that, I mean, certain categories are dominated by foreign brands because yeah. that kind of technology, that kind of manufacturing capability is extremely difficult to replicate, right? So yeah. mobile phones is, a, is an example, laptops, computer yeah. devices, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think the question is always around. Um, so w within DigiStyle, we're sort of a sort of a fashion website equivalent of Zalando in Iran, uh, sort of a sister company to DigiKala, uh, which is kind of like a journal merchandise platform of uh, of Iran. And when you look at it um, in categories where there is basically local production as well as also f uh, foreign imports allowed to still take place, and as part of our sort of corporate responsibility, we always have taken it upon ourselves to continuously promote uh, f uh, domestically manufactured, domestically made products. But unfortunately, a lot of them tend to have uh, fundamental issues in terms of the cost of manufacturing being too high or the quality not being at par yeah. in terms of uh, basically uh, even when you do have high level of duties and tariffs and all of these sorts of things. So when you compare the two, I think the consumer ultimately is very quite smart in terms of how they make purchase decisions. And then ultimately, even though as a platform we do promote uh, locally manufactured products, you tend to find that on the pros and cons of an Iranian consumer, mm -hmm. um, uh, in certain categories, it's, it becomes very difficult for Iranian products to win. No. But certainly in other areas like hygienics, et cetera, I think um, Iranian manufacturers have been phenomenally successful, and I think uh, foreigners are finding it very difficult to compete with them. Mm. Um, and I think uh, those categories will, t I think, continue to be dominated by Iranians. Yeah. I think you have to look at this category by category, mm -hmm. but I think uh, <coughs> the long and short of the story is uh, you can't really force the Iranian consumer onto a product no. just by the mere uh, sort of policy stances that are being taken by the Iranian authorities. And um, Mehdi, in terms of, of your business, uh, e-books, yeah. are they increasing in sales or decreasing? Because in, in the West now, they, tend, they seem to be decreasing. No, in Iran, is growing up because it's the new industry. We started the first action about two years and a half ago. Mm -hmm. So now we, are, we didn't reach, we haven't reached yet the maximum booming. I think I expect more. I yeah. mean, uh, sales in future because the numbers of the book is almost 60,000 titles each year yeah. pro the, uh, published in Iran. And newly, we got Wiley, Oxford, and Cambridge 
publisher's book on this uh, terminal. I think that's going uh, on, it's, it's increasing. But for the previous question, we have a dialogue, huh? Let's, let's find a solution. Iranian prefer the, the product from foreign or from Iran. Okay, mm. shall we find a solution? What kind of a solution we can create that the market will be saturated by mm. the good quality uh, products? Mm -hmm. You know that in Iran we have a very uh, uh, a small manufacturing with a medium size and large size producer. Okay, the equipment and machinery are European. It's not created by Iran. We bought it from Italy, Switzerland, Germany. The Iranian engineer graduated students is the first, the number mm. per capita is the first in the world. Mm. Iran, the third uh, number uh, in the world for the engineer graduates. Mm -hmm. The cost of the energy is less than Italy, France, England. The consumer is over 600 million. Iran is 80 million. Mm -hmm. Iran is the another country. So Iran could be a core of the region. Mm -hmm. So if the, uh, what Iran needs in, the, in, in retail, we need finishing, we need investment, and we need know-how. Because the equipment is producing the same as you produced it. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between Iranian preference and European? Because of the finishing, because of the know-how. If the big European companies, large Europe, European comes and buy the small manufacturer in Iran, or because there is now existing companies to produce retail, they don't waste their time. They come easily to the market. Mm. They don't need a, 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 a huge survey because the survey is available. So in this, in this kind of formula, European companies make a joint venture or buying the mm. existing company in Iran, upgrade it in finishing and in know-how. So in this way, you have Iranian made and with the European quality. So we did it. Exactly we did it in Iran in a certain business. For example, in a steel, the, uh, one Italian company bought a steel company in uh, Esfahan. Yeah. They didn't invest too much because they didn't want to start from zero. Mm -hmm. They have it, the existing company. So they gave them know-how, they transferred the technology and the investment is less. The production cost is less because of the graduate student, because of the energy, because of the clients, 600 clients around there. All of them needs Iran and needs this product. Okay. So this is the solution we can solve the Iranian preference. I hope. <laughs> what about, I mean, you talk about transferring know-how. What is the protection for IP in Iran, for intellectual property? Ali Reza. IP, IP, what, what? IP is intellectual property. So for example, if you are, um, mm. Well, um, if you are a no, I, I Dyson. Understand. Yeah. I understand, yeah. I understand. But um, um, unfortunately, I'm not an expert on that. So uh, maybe I'll uh, can um, answer. I mean, uh, unf unfortunately, not much. Um, yeah. So there is not much um, respect for intellectual property and trademark rights, et cetera, in mm. Iran. I mean, a lot of a lot of companies have tried to basically uh, use le law firms domestically, internationally, to try and basically uh, impose signage rights, et cetera. Et cetera. Yeah. But uh, it's it, it had less uh, precedent before, but nowadays I think there's a bigger wave of protectionism that's happening. And as a part of that wave of protectionism, yeah. nowadays uh, foreign brands who are looking to operate in Iran do need to apply for a license. And as part of that, then they get a little bit of a uh, yeah. I think I mean, signage the protection. Is there, is a minimum, there is a minimum level of protection, um, but it's not what international brands would like it to be. But I think it's probably worth pointing out that that's not different from a number of other no. large developing countries in the world. Um, or in indeed in China. The Far East. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's the obvious one. So uh, the answer is that you know, international brands use other ways to manage that risk, to protect their brand in more practical ways than necessarily falling back on a legal framework. Mm.
mean, if, if, I, if I could, I mean, I, mean, I, I think um, ultimately if you look at Iran five years into the future, um, I think there's, there's, there's three perfect storms that are happening right now that's going to be shaping uh, the future of Iranian retail going forward. Um, on, on, on the first hand, you have this basically eco-political wave, uh, positive wave before, which has now quite been dampened, but uh, nevertheless, I think the fact that we had the Europe, uh, sort of the JCPOA come in, uh, raised a lot of uh, eyebrows of international retailers on Iran as kind of like the only last sort of consumer space uh, in the, in not only in the region, but also globally. Where else are you going to find a millennial population base quite very sort of uh, well-connected and, and uh, sort of uh, forward in terms of their consumer behaviors, et cetera? Uh, that's been dampened a little bit as part of the first wave, predominantly by this uh, sort of secondary wave of protectionism that's come onto the market. Um, as part of the Iranian authorities push to drive the resistance economy and wanting to promote local manufacturing, et cetera, and made it very difficult for international retailers to come in. But nevertheless, you still have the second wave, which has been predominantly, uh, it's, it hasn't been publicized much, but you have something close to around 400 shopping malls that are currently under development in Iran. Yeah. And, uh, a lot of them have been basically given licenses without much sort of uh, thinking at 30,000 feet uh, from sort of uh, municipalities' point of views, et cetera. And what you will find is that out of the 400 or so, the bulk of which, and for, um, I mean, uh, to the panelists prior, have been predominantly backed by the Iranian banks. So mm -hmm. there's $80 billion of uh, worth of sh uh, commitments in terms of investment that has been put onto the to the ground. According to the estimates that we've put together, there's around half of it has already been deployed. So the Iranian banks are close to $40 billion into a lot of these shopping malls. But what you find is that a lot of them are basically cannibalizing off of one another. Yeah. So uh, you will find one that's maybe a five minute walking distance away from the other, uh, a lot of close adjacencies. And unfortunately, nowadays, I think what what we find in Iranian retail is that I think Iranian retail will be somewhat of a leapfrog economy uh, or a leapfrog industry yeah. in the sense that you're going to start to see the industry skip a couple of steps, i.e. you're not going to see the development of the high street as you would have seen in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, you will probably not see all 400 shopping malls be working phenomenally well. Will Devon survive? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think they're in good hands. <laughs> but I think uh, what, what you will what you will actually find is that uh, out of those 400 or so shopping malls, mm. around 30 of them are the ones that will really have a healthy life. Uh, nowadays, in shopping malls, I think what you find is that the ones that have strong retail attainment, there's a lot of attractions around it, etc., are the ones that will do well. And being biased as it may be, yeah. but uh, we find that uh, ultimately how you you will see e-commerce probably I was just going to ask, uh, e the outpace the of e -commerce. Uh, I think you will find that e-commerce will probably outpace the development of brick and mortar retail because mm. firstly uh, I think uh, a lot of these shopping malls are going to fail uh, predominantly because the, the development is all happening at the same time the malls haven't had the chance or the opportunity to differentiate themselves vis-a-vis -vis mm. the other and um, ultimately uh, in, in a world where I think you, you, you're, you're predominantly dominated, uh, the consumer uh, sphere is predominantly dominated by millennials, um, and internet penetration and mobile phone penetration within them are north of 70% or so, uh, you'll find that basically e-commerce will probably outpace the development of uh, brick and mortar so retail in the market. So what will happen to Book City if yeah. you have the equivalent of Amazon, which uh, can deliver a book to me a cheaper price than Waterstones in Britain, for example, and do it within 24 hours. Yeah, uh, regarding the IP protection, mm -hmm. uh, two months ago, this is a good thing after an imposed sanction, two months ago, the Minister of Industry called for all brands, foreign brands, to come and register and to approve they are franchisee official licensed. Mm. So now, 
in two months, they start checking all brands. For example, I have Cavalli Versace. Okay, we have a lot of fake Cavalli Versace in Iran. So, they went through the malls, as he said, and the uh, shops, stores, they check. If they have the license, they let them work. If not, they closed it, they take out the, 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 the logo of the, of the shops, and they charge them penalty. So, they, when you have the relation internationally, economically with the world, you have to protect the private. Yeah. So they start practicing what I can say as a good promise that in two, three years, I am sure that in book we start because IP in book and other product, cultural products yes, is if, very if my book sells in your bookstore, will I get a royalty? No, no, we started, you know, no, no, no. Now they cannot, no, they never, they stop it. But the publishers, Iranian yeah. publishers, would like to be in the international market. Yeah. So they should respect. They should. This yeah. is the way, you know, it's law and practice. Yeah. Just law cannot protect it. You have to have the culture <laughs> of the international cooperation. Is this we is a start. Well, for we, we for for yeah, for uh, the brands, um, it's different. I mean, that's especially for fashion yeah. uh, section. Um, laws and regulations uh, changed recently and became very, very strict. You, yeah. you need to register a brand as a franchisee or distributor of a and brand. And the law is being applied. Yes. Because in lots of countries, including my own, there are lots of laws, but they're not always yeah, applied. But, but they are very serious about yeah. that. They, yeah. they, um, they check your license, your uh, documents. If you don't have a document, they close your stores. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's become <laughs> very, very... Uh, We've got uh, just uh, seven minutes and 39 seconds left. Uh, questions from the audience, please. Yes, gentleman there. And a young lady is rushing towards you. <laughs> uh, thank you for the great discussion. I'm from Procter & Gamble. My name is Russell Mackey. I'm in charge of uh, consumer and market insights for Iran. Uh, <coughs> thank you for the point in terms of the three perfect storms uh, coming our way. I have exactly the same observation seeing the trends that we have. Uh, if we just project out the sentiment of that in terms of five years from now, is actually not really a positive one. Because if you think you know, of all that investment and you say you know, a large amount of those big investments will fail, in terms of the malls. But not only that, it's the I, I, my question is, what about the traditional trade, the pharmacists, the cosmetic stores today? They're not certainly, you know, the market is not growing at the rate at which e-commerce is developing, at the rate at which modern trade is developing. Do you see that these smaller traditional stores are the ones that are gonna bear the brunt of hurricane, whatever we call it, the moment it hits? <laughs> hmm. Good question. Um, I, I think, uh, should I address it first? Because yeah. uh, it was uh, talking about my per yeah. perfect storm. Uh, <laughs> um, so so uh, in terms of your observation, I think um, um, our, our family group, Shakufa Group, has been sort of, uh, we've been traditionally wholesalers uh, with basically uh, one of your competitors, Beiersdorf. Uh, and then we've been doing sort of retail and participating in the development of retail, and then we've also been doing e-commerce. And, um, and then ultimately, I, th I think how we see the future is that um, as wholesalers and distributors, the um, wholesaler and distribution will continue to be relevant, probably for another sort of uh, seven or eight years uh, prior to you seeing the development of basically shopping malls, which will be driving uh, a lot of the organized retail, even in food, non-food FMCGs. So if you look at the 400 or so shopping malls that I was alluding to, uh, around 320 something of them do have hypermarket supermarkets associated with them and as well as also uh, sort of food courts, etc. And um, ultimately, when you see the development of High Street, um, uh, ultimately, when you do see the development of High Street, you will basically find that that business will no longer be relevant, predominantly because uh, you're going to find that um, uh, 
60% of your business will become then key accounts. Um, and then the issue there, uh, and, and there lies the, I think the, 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 the quirk in that I, we don't believe that uh, retail in itself is going to be the biggest part of this. We believe very strongly that e-commerce is likely to be probably, if you look at your key accounts as a, as a Procter & Gamble, will definitely be uh, sort of number one or number two in terms of the key accounts you'll be managing in Iran sort of six, seven years down the line. And, and I think a lot of that issue is predominantly because of um, the fact that you have a millennial consumer that's used to shopping that way. Ali, our countdown Sorry clock that. still gives us three minutes, 56 seconds. However, I think the bell tolled for us. Um, <laughs> we are running a little late and we have one more keynote speech before the uh, breakout. So could I thank you all very, very much for an excellent panel. Thank you. And uh, Rasul Dinavad.